I want to welcome everybody to a very special presentation, SOFO Zoom panel discussion program. Uh, the title of this program is called SOFO Shark Research and Education Team Update. Um, and I'm very fortunate and lucky enough to have the team of researchers as panelists for today's program. Uh, I'm Frank Rubetto, I'm the director of the South Fork Natural History Museum, and I just want to inform everybody that's listening and watching right now how important I feel um, and how lucky I am to be part of this, this initiative and this program with these four panels, panelists. And not only are they science researchers that are involved in this program, but they're also friends of mine. We all went to school together, and I hope one of you guys can just elaborate a little bit about the history at some point on how we came to this point and, and where we are at the moment, how we all went to the same school and, and, and got reconnected again after we all separated and, and here we are doing this, this, this initiative and trying to make a change and, and, and create the stewardship that's necessary for, for, the, for the marine ecosystem, but most importantly for the health of our planet. So the mission of this program, which SOFA took the uh, undertaking back in 2018, the mission is for the SOFA Shark Research and Education program is to enhance the stewardship of Long Island shark community through scientific research, data sharing with marine resource managers and educating the public about, public about their important ecological roles. So when SOFA took this initiative and uh, decided to take on this research project, uh, we felt that it was extremely important to create the awareness to the community about the importance of sharks in our ecosystem and the role that they play. And in the future, when there's things that are proposed that might intervene and inhibit the, the health of the oceans, it's the, the research team's responsibility and SOFO's responsibility to come up with the data that's necessary to plan and manage these uh, habitats appropriately. Um, so that's kind of how we got involved uh, as, as a nonprofit organization to take the lead on this, this important research project. Uh, as you can see, I'm set up at the lower level of our museum in front of our uh, state-of-the-art interactive social shark research and education exhibit. It's a touchscreen exhibit. It informs the visitors on the work that the team is doing. It also informs them about the anatomy of the shark and the ecological role that they play. It's kind of um, it's infinite. I mean, there's so much information that you can achieve from coming to this exhibit and learning from it. And I want to thank all the panel speakers, all the uh, supporters that were able to uh, fund and come up with the information to create this wonderful exhibit that I'm in front of at the moment. Um, so before I get started, I want to give everybody a little overview on how we're going to do this today. I don't want to keep everybody, uh, you know, uh, informed for two hours. I'd like for this panel discussion to go for maybe an hour or so. But the idea is for me to introduce each panel speaker and then give each one of you guys about three minutes to kind of elaborate a little bit about the work that you're doing, your backgrounds, and uh, how you got to this particular place in your careers to, to lead a program like this. Um, so first and foremost, I want to introduce you to Dr. Toby Curtis. Toby, maybe wave real quick. And uh, Dr. Toby Curtis is our lead science collaborator for the Sulphur Shark Research and Education Program. He has a marine biology degree from Long Island University Southampton College. He has a master's degree from the University of Florida and his PhD, and his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Dr. Curtis has been studying the ecology behavior and fisheries biology of shark skates and rays for over 20 years. So, Dr. Curtis, thanks for being here and being a part of this uh, panel discussion. Thanks, Frank. That's good. How are you, buddy? I'm good. Hey, man. So, Greg Metzger is our Chief Field and Education Coordinator for SOFO Shark Research and Education Program. Uh, he brings his field expertise and educational training to the program. He also received his undergraduate degree in marine biology from Long Island University Southampton College and has a master's degree in secondary education from Stony Brook University. Greg is a marine science teacher at Southampton High School and has been fishing for sharks in New York waters for more than 12 years. So Greg, thanks man for, for being a part of this program and taking the time to, to be here today. Thanks. Pleasure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now you have Chris Papa, Fish Guy Photos. Uh, Chris is one of SoFo Sharp Research and Education collaborators since the beginning of the program. Chris Papa is one of the leading naturalists here on Long Island, born and raised here. Chris has been exploring the wilds of the island for over 30 years. As a wildlife photographer, writer, and lecturer, Chris enjoys bringing public awareness to the out to the, that, about the diverse wildlife that calls Long Island home. His passion for coastal ecology, fishing, and the outdoors led him to obtain a BS in marine biology, also from LU Southampton, and currently manages the new Marine Sciences Center at Southampton campus of Stony Brook University. In addition to freelance writing for several fishing and wildlife related publications, Chris currently writes the monthly naturalist logbook column for New York, New Jersey edition of On the Water magazine. So Chris, man, thanks for taking the time and allowing us to use your webinar Zoom access because we don't have one at the museum. So I appreciate you giving us this opportunity to reach out to the community to inform everybody on the work that we're doing. So I appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge a couple of other shark research collaborators that are not here as panel speakers. Uh, Captain Matt Burkout, Walter Zubrionis, and Jeff Metzger, who are part of the 2020 SOFO Shark Research uh, field team. So they've been helping us out uh, since the beginning of the summer. And uh, I just want to acknowledge them and thank them too for, for helping along with this, with this program. I also want to let participants know out there that everybody that's on the panel at this moment and those other collaborators that I just mentioned are doing this on a volunteer basis. They're not getting paid to do this. They're doing this because they believe in the mission and they believe in sustaining and are committed to this program. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that when these guys go out and collect the data, they're doing it without being paid. They're doing it because they love they love this and believe in this project. So I want to thank everybody for doing the work that you're doing. I appreciate it. It's a lot of effort. And um, thank you. Thank you again. I really appreciate it from the director's perspective of a museum and a nonprofit organization. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to open the, uh, the three minute. I have a timer, guys. So I'm going to allow each panelist to, <laughs> to talk about yourselves and how you got to this point. So I think I'm going to lead it off with Toby, uh, just giving a little bit of feedback on on your background and how you got to this point with this program. So, Toby, you're on the spot, my man. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can do better than three minutes. Thank you, Frank. This is, uh, this is great. Um, yeah, just real brief background on me. I, I grew up in uh, central Massachusetts. Um, I grew up loving fishing and uh, I was fascinated with sharks from a very young age. And uh, so that led me to go to college down on Long Island at Southampton College. And that's where I met all these bozos. And uh, we all kind of went through together, um, had a lot of fun along the way. Um, and uh, I started researching sharks and, and getting more into like the scientific literature and, and, and getting experience on the water with sharks while I was in college at Southampton. Uh, so I owe a lot to that program. Um, and uh, I actually initially learned about juvenile white sharks being found off Long Island while I was at Southampton. I thought that was, you know, pretty amazing. And I thought, man, someday it may be really cool to, you know, to try to study these things. Um, but that was, you know, um, that was a long time ago. Uh, I went and got my master's degree in Florida studying juvenile bull sharks. Um, and I did my PhD at UMass studying basking sharks. And all of that, all of the research, the common thread connecting these things was, uh, was technology and, and tracking technology mainly using, using electronic tags, acoustic and satellite uh, tracking technologies to study the ecology and fishery biology of these animals. Um, sharks are um, amazing animals. There's, there's over 500 species. And um, uh, so I, all, going through all that, you know, that research experience, uh, that's the common thread has really been about the technology and, and trying to solve real world like fisheries problems um, and address overfishing and, and rebuild shark populations. Um, so currently my day job for the last 15 years, I've been working for NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service based in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, and I, I work on shark fisheries management. That's mainly um, my job, uh, but I get to do um, this sort of this research um, along the way. And I got to, uh, you know, reconnect with these college buddies, you know, several years ago now and just, just going out shark fishing for fun. And it would kind of circle back to this concept of, 
hey, you know, there's a lot of juvenile great white sharks found off of Long Island. Nobody is studying them. Let's see if we can go out and find them. And uh, thanks to a lot of hours um, Greg put in on the water, um, you know, we were able to finally have a breakthrough of that. And the last five years have been amazing. This has been one of the most exciting and fun collaborations I've ever had. Um, working with friends and trying to do some really cutting edge science um, in a special place. Long Island is a very special place personally, um, as well as ecologically. And uh, the sharks are a big piece of that. And so it's, um, it's really been a blast to, to be part of this program. Fantastic, thank you, Dr. Curtis. All right, Chris Paparo, man, you're next. You got three minutes. Thank you. There we go. All right, so thank you. Uh, thanks um, for having me part of this. This has been a lot of fun, like Toby said, just kind of working with three, you know, three other friends, and actually more than three friends now because the gro group has grown a little bit. But um, for me, I got started when I was a kid. I was five or six years old. I caught a fish. My first fish was a flounder off the Shinnecock Canal, and I've been kind of hooked ever since. Um, you know, the uh, educating, I think, the public about things they don't know or things that are in their own backyard is most important to me. So if anybody follows my work, you know, as fish guy, uh, fish guy photos, you'll see, I'm always just trying to promote local Long Island wildlife ecology. You know, there's a lot of things. I get a lot of comments, you know, I've been here 50, 60 years and uh, I've never knew that. And uh, that's kind of what's most important to me is just to try to get people aware of their surroundings. I think if the more we're aware, the better we'll have a uh, better chance. We'll have it fixing some of these problems. We don't necessarily need to spend, individually spend millions of dollars ourselves, but uh, just being aware and being aware of what you're doing, I think will make the biggest impact. And again, letting people know that these, these animals are right here in our own backyard, um, I think ties that home connection and makes it even more special. So uh, that's kind of my role with this, this group. Fantastic. Mr. Metzger, Chief Coordinator. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Frank, for the opportunity. Thank everyone uh, that, that has played, you know, um, for those of you that if, that if you've been following uh, us or that, um, you know, my, my job is I, I take care of all the field work. So I, I feel like I have the most responsibility because if I can't catch the animals and get them alongside the boat, none of this is able to happen. Um, so I, I grew up in Western New York. Um, we have more cow, we still have more cows than people that live in our county, but I always wanted to be a marine scientist ever since I was a little kid. Um, the first time I saw salt water was in the summer of my 11th grade in high school when I came down to a small marine science university called uh, the Southampton campus of Long Island University. They offered a, a summer program for high school kids. And my chemistry teacher was clearing his, his board off at the end of the school year. He's like, anybody want to be a marine biologist? <laughs> Just as he's getting ready to throw the, the letter in the garbage, I was like, well, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so I, I took it, I brought it home. I said, Hey, I don't know, you know, mom and dad, if this is something we could do. And they're like, well, you know, you've always wanted to be a marine scientist, but you never really had an opportunity to go and do and see. And here sounds like a perfect opportunity. So I, I came down to, to the Southampton campus and did a summer program. And, um, I, I never left. I've actually been on Long Island now longer than I, I lived upstate. And so I got into fishing. Um, you know, I did more hunting upstate than I, I was able to down here just because of access. And down here, I was able to do more fishing than I did upstate because of access. And so I got tired of being seeing the fish just outside of my casting range. So uh, when I finally had enough money, I, I bought a boat before I bought my, no, uh, I bought my truck and then uh, I was able to buy a small boat and we started fishing in the bay and then as we started to get more and more fish, we started to move up the food chain. And um, it was a 17 and a half foot center console. And on really flat days, I would sneak out the inlet and drop a chum bucket in and, and we started catching sharks. And so it was, it was never about bringing them back to the dock and hanging them up and having everybody hoot and holler about how awesome I was. It was really uh, having the background in marine science. I knew that every shark I was catching and releasing was data swimming away from for somebody. Um, the only thing you ever hear about sharks is we need more data. We don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about it. And so, you know, having that marine science background and knowing that I had access to very valuable data to somebody, um, I was, might have been Toby that I talked to or Chris. It was somebody, you know, I was saying, geez, you know, I got all this data swimming away. And they're like, well, why don't you join the cooperative shark tagging program? So what's that? He said, well, it's a citizen science project that uh, was started by the National Marine Fisheries Service and uh, NOAA back in 1963. And it put tags uh, in the hands of recreational fishermen who were catching sharks and letting them go. 
non-electronic. It was free to us. And uh, I was like, wow, this is great. It's something, you know? And so um, Chris and I had stayed connected. We had all started to re-kind of connect at this point in time. And so we went out and we were putting apex predator tags in, in sharks. And it was, it was great because now at least we were contributing something to, to data, data to science. Um, I'm out with Chris and my dad, and you can just kind of see it here is a, a picture of a small mako shark that we caught in apex predator tag. Um, Chris was on board. We got great photos of it. We let it go. And the idea of this tag is that you get, you get snapshots of this shark throughout its life as it's recaptured. So we caught this shark. We tagged it. We knew how big it was, where it was, and we let it go. We caught it about four or five miles south of Shinnecock Inlet. Uh, it was recaptured a year and a half later uh, off the coast of Africa. So it was like 2,200 miles away that this shark was recaptured. And it sort of com it was the first recapture and sort of completed that circle of data that we could collect. And it was like, wow, this is, this is really amazing. But so we've learned a lot about the shark. We know it can swim to Africa from Long Island. We know it can gain a couple of pounds along in those years, but there's a lot of data missing in between. And so at this point now, Toby's starting to come into the picture and he plants the seed in my head as he told you like, hey man, you know, if you're out shark fishing, yeah, Long Island might be a nursery for white sharks. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, man. He says, here's the paper. Like they're out there supposedly. He says, if you can get on them and catch them, he says, we could be in for a hell of a ride. So I was like, you mean to tell me I can go out here right where I'm fishing and catch baby white sharks? He's like, supposedly. So I was like, all right, game on. And so uh, we got permitted up. We had a, a tag donated to us, a, a satellite tag donated to us from the Large Pelagic Research Center um, back in 2015. And the goal was to go out and try to try to catch a baby white shark. And uh, we fished uh, 54 days that summer. And uh, I was just about ready to go back to work at the end of August. And we were able to catch and tag the first ever uh, young of the year white shark with a satellite tag. And so, so that, that, you know, that sort of progression that got us to where we're at now. Chris probably always loves to hear that because Chris, you were supposed to be on the boat when they caught that first juvenile white shark, weren't you? Yeah, it's a story of me when it comes to this group. I'm never on the boat when something cool happens. I'm always <laughs> hearing about it with over beers later, but I'm very rarely on the boat. So, yeah, I get a little bitter about that. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, so great. That must have been some uh, event catching that, that first juvenile white shark and tagging it in the North Atlantic. And that kind of put our Long Island Shark Collaborating Research Team on the map, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that. That uh, I mean, we were. It was. It was sort of a really unknown, uh, unbelievable experience. Um, it, it ended up being a, a big first. Um, you know, some the the that that the year class that we've been focused on these last five years really. And to Toby certainly can speak to this better than I can. But really, was was void in is in mm. the data set for the most part. And so the fact that in the last five years we've gone from uh, zero to now 32, 31 um, is, is pretty remarkable. And we've got excellent uh, satellite tracking data and a lot, some of these sharks have multiple tags on them. Um, and so we're, we're able to get horizontal and vertical movement through the water um, over mul you know, multiple months. And have, you know, we've been able to identify the, the overwintering. So not only you know, did our work show that Long Island is indeed a nursery for, for juvenile white sharks? Our work has confirmed that. Um, we've been able to find also where these, these young of the year overwinter for at least their first year. That's off the Carolinas. Um, so in five years, we've come a long, hmm. long way um, with this particular year class. Um, so it's, it's each one. I haven't caught enough white sharks yet to be like, oh, there's another one. I mean, it, it's really amazing when when it, you get get it up and your eyes recognize that we have another juvenile white shark, it's just a remarkable experience. Yeah, it's like seeing, it's like seeing a bald eagle on the on the east end of Long Island now. Every time you see one, you're still amazed at how majestic they are. Even though they can be consistently seen now, if you're out and about, you can see a juvenile and a bald eagle now. But it, it's not to that point yet where you're like, ah, another bald eagle. It's, yeah an amazing experience when you see that. And I, I can attest to what you're saying about white sharks. And every time you see one, you're just amazed at how we have this apex predator right in our backyard developing to control the ecosystem. And we're actually doing something about it. So 
thanks for you know elaborating a little bit about how we got to this point. Now, Toby, can you talk a little bit about once Greg tagged that first juvenile white shark in the North Atlantic, who we caught interest from and how we became uh, you know, associated with O Search and Chris Fisher. Can you just give a little bit of background on that? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I was very excited. It was sort of like proof of concept when Greg was able to catch that shark and get the tag out. It was like, all right, well, we have enough, a little bit of information now that we can, um, that maybe we can feasibly target these things. We can get better at fishing for them. Um, and so we, we sort of put the, um, put the news out on social media, basically on Twitter, Facebook and stuff. Hey, we, we tagged a, white, a juvenile white shark. Um, you know, that we're, I, as far as I know, we're the first to do it in, in the uh, North Atlantic Ocean. It's a very exciting kind of milestone. You, you know, we, we got a little bit of data from that first tag, but not a lot. Um, but then basically, uh, you know, Chris, uh, Chris Fisher from OSEARCH, he reached out to me um, through social media and uh, he was excited. He was like, oh, this is great. Like you, you got a juvenile white shark. Um, wh what do you think about doing a, um, an expedition in New York with OSEARCH? And we were sort of like, well, we have no, you know, we have no tag money. We have no tags. We, you know, we're just been kind of doing it out of our, uh, out of our pockets at this point. And so um, at the time it was a great opportunity. And so they came up in uh, 2016 and 2017 and um, you know, they, they just boosted our, our ability to, uh, to catch these sharks. And we, we tagged over those two years, we tagged an additional 20 sharks uh, with them. And that's sort of their, Kind of target sample size for white shark age classes so they were hoping to you know uh, to sort of move, get tag 20 and um uh, of the young of the years and, and that's what we did it was and uh we were all kind of surprised how successful we were we were hoping we could catch a few um right. but we um you know they really used their knowledge and shared their knowledge with us and got us in in these spots where we were able to really really dial in on the on the juvenile white sharks and what it was it's crazy because once we found them weren't catching anything else, and Greg can talk more about that. But it was an exciting couple of years because we we really uh, OSEARCH really helped um, propel the science um, forward pretty quickly for us, and we've been able to continue, um, you know, where we left off with them the last few years. And uh, we you know we continue to get new tags out. We're doing trying new tags, new new technologies, uh, just sort you know just building and building um, and trying to get a really great um, really great data set on these on uh, on these little sharks. Well, Toby, why is it why is it so important to do this? Why why are we doing this? What is what what is the rationale behind going out and tagging these sharks? What are we trying to accomplish? What do you, what do you want to see as a biologist? The objective sure. of the program. The um, yeah, I mean, really, to to start to conserve and manage something, you need to know where it is and, and when it's there. Um, and that was what Greg was saying. It was, there was a bit, huge data gap for young of the year white sharks. We didn't know exactly where the nursery was. We, there was some, you know, scattered sightings and catch records over the years, but there was no movement data. There's no habitat use data, very little um, data in general on these young of the year sharks. So we, um, as soon as you can get tags on them, you can start to fill in these gaps. So, um, so to me, that's, you know, we're just scratching the surface. We, you get some tags on these things, you start to figure out where they go when they're in certain places, what kind of habitats they they um, they use, and are which habitats are important to them, and then you start to fill in those gaps, and you can use that information to better uh, to better conserve and, and manage that, that population, and that's that's across the board for all the you know fish species we, we think about. There's comparable data on all kinds of important commercial and recreational species, and uh, and tagging, um, especially electronic tagging, is an important component of um of research for a lot of fish species up and down the coast and so we're, we've been able to lead the way on filling in those gaps specifically for the juvenile white sharks um, in the north atlantic so it's um it's very exciting just to clarify someone was asking uh what osearch is and if, if you're unfamiliar you could check out their website it's osearch.org o-c-e-a-r-c-h and uh they're a um a research and education organization and they specialize in, in basically putting satellite tags on on large sharks to help um, to help improve science and, and education on those species. Um, I'm always getting calls at the museum who are always asking why are there more sharks in the water now? Why, why are we seeing more populations of sharks along the south shore of Long Island? 
Can you elaborate a little bit about conservation uh, aspects and if technology is a part of this, people having more cell phones, there's more documentation of, of people videotaping sharks as to why people feel that there are more sharks around? Have these sharks been here for thousands, if not millions of years? Can you kind of give us some idea of what's happening in the oceans these days on a conservation standpoint, if that's something that you discuss? Talk about this, about conservation, the bill that may be passed last year, protecting the harvest of Atlantic Menhaden for per se uh, commercial harvesting. Maybe that has some influence on how healthy the ecosystem has become, or is it technology? You know, with, the, with you being a photographer and an activist, are you uh, kind of pinpointing the sightings of more sharks to technology, or is this conservation? I, I mean, personally, my own opinion, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I, you know, I'm out there a lot, as as are Greg and, and Toby, and I've definitely seen more sharks in recent years than I have in past years. Uh, you mentioned Bunker. You know, Bunker is a fish that nobody cared about. Uh, you can't eat them. And if that comes from me, you know you can't eat them. I'll eat anything. You can't eat them. <laughs> you just, you, you can't, can't eat them. So nobody, nobody cared about them. Uh, so it was like an unregulated fishery. You know, there's two types of fisheries. There's a bait fishery where they catch them for bait for lobster and crab and whatnot. And then there's a reduction fishery where they take them and reduce them to other stuff, such as, you know, fish oils, animal feed and, and whatnot. Um, then they, you know, people, managers, fisheries managers like Toby started realizing, hey, these fish feed everything, not only, you know, sharks and striped bass and bluefish and tuna and swordfish, but birds, eagles, osprey, I mean, I would hate to come back in a second life as a bunker. Uh, <laughs> everything trying to eat you. It's just, uh, but you know, once they regulated that fishery and, and managed it properly, um, the number of bunker exploded. And uh, within years, we start seeing humpbacks off the shore and sharks and, you know, but there's also a two edge that. So why are we seeing more humpbacks? Well, they were also protected, you know, and their numbers have come back. I mean, talk about a success story. Humpback whales are no longer in danger or threatened in, or listed. They're listed as vulnerable, but that's because of what they are. But um, they made a huge comeback, and that's an animal that was almost wiped from this planet, or at least in the Atlantic. So, um, so I think it's a lot of stuff. And then, like you said, with technology, I mean, just before we started, I had someone text me a picture of a tiger shark uh, that they just caught today. I don't. I'm waiting for details on where and how far out and stuff. But you hear stuff instantly. When I was a kid, you'd go into a tackle shop and you'd hear. From the guy behind the counter hey this guy joe he was out two weeks ago and i heard his friend caught this it's this whole telephone game you don't know but now instantly you catch something even i'm even myself i see something cool in an instant i can broadcast it to my twenty thousand followers and everybody knows and then they share it so you know what catching one shark i mean just look at the white shark that greg caught uh as toby mentioned we tweeted about it and that got chris chris fisher's attention i mean that would never have happened 10 years ago you know right. so i think it's a little bit of both i mean i definitely think you know conservation has helped a lot on a lot of these fronts yeah one of our board members who's state assemblyman stephen engelbright which will be on this uh zoom program at the moment was very influential in getting that bill passed last year along with john turner and uh assemblyman fred deal and many other of our leaders, uh, you know, executive leaders in, in the New York State Assembly were able to have Governor Cuomo sign this bill. So it is probably one of the most important fish species in the Atlantic Ocean because it feeds everything and it's everything's connected. So I'm sure the white juvenile white sharks that we're studying and the dusky sharks and the sandbar sharks are all along the south shore of Long Island feeding on this resource this bunker menhaden population that hopefully will be sustained for many years to come. And that will basically be a reaction for the sustainability of other species that rely on foraging on those fish. So a very important bill that passed. So hopefully the, the oceans will continue to be healthy and robust and continue to be sustainable for many years to come. Greg, man, I would like to ask you a question about the methodology and the technique of catching the sharks that we're tagging. Yeah. Uh, people always ask me, is it stressful on the shark when we bring it to the boat? How are we processing it to allow the shark to be released, at least the most, you know, less amount of stress on the shark as possible? Can you talk about the technique and, 
how you feel uh, that the, the methods that we're using are not harmful to the species that we're tagging? Yeah, um, so we, we, you know, for our work, our work really is interested in how these sharks are utilizing our waters. So a dead shark is not a good shark for us. A compromised shark in terms of health or uh, injury is, is a, it's, we don't want that. So we do, I and uh, Matt Burkhout and uh, Walter Zublionis and everybody that you've been hearing, um, we go to great lengths to make sure that everyone is, is trained and, and is following the same sort of protocols that, that it's just evolved over the years and, and catching and releasing and, and doing the work that we do with hundreds of sharks. So we're targeting uh, just a few species of sharks right now, um, but we catch a lot of different species. And so some of the things that we do is uh, we use size appropriate gear. So what does that mean? That means we, we use, um, we're not catching these big animals with very light tackle. Um, the longer they're fighting, the more they're fighting, uh, the, the, the more uh, energy they're expelling, uh, the weaker they are when we are able to get them alongside the boat. So we use heavy gear, heavy line, much bigger than, than what you would traditionally be using because we're not recreational fishermen, we're researchers. And so it's important for us to be able to get that animal, get it alongside the boat, do the work that we need to do and get it back in the water as quickly as possible. And right now, um, we're basically about 12 minutes. So from the time that we, um, we, we get the animal secured alongside the vessel, we do our work and get it back in the water. It's typically uh, less than 12 minutes. Um, so heavy if gear. You, if, you, if you don't want me asking, in the, within those 12 minutes, what's happening? What are you, what are you doing yeah. in 12 minutes? So, so a full, a full workup, um, and this would be depending, a full workup would, would require some additional collaborating scientists. So um, I, I don't have the capacity to, so we, we work with many, many organizations. I was, Chris alluded to um, the success of, that we've been able to have in terms of putting up consistent numbers of these juvenile white sharks. Lots of researchers are interested. And so we try to foster and support their work um, with with the, the animals that we have. So even though we're not necessarily interested in the blood chemistry of a juvenile white shark for our specific work here through the shark research program, uh, other biologists are. And that just helps the more data that we can feed to these other biologists, um, the more uh, we're able to utilize this rare opportunity with this particular individual and it makes all of our work more robust. So we can answer scientifically the question you've asked about stress on the animals. So that's one of the things that's being looked at is the stress indicators and stress markers uh, through the blood that's being taken. So if we have um, uh, Dr. Harley Newton on board, she takes a blood sample immediately upon uh, securing, safely securing the animal. We do our 12 minute workup and then just before we let it go, she takes another blood sample. And so she's able to actually look at stressors and oxygen levels and pH levels of the blood during our workup uh, so that we know what are, what are we doing? Is, is the animal stressed? Is it getting better while we're doing it? Is there something that you know, we need to do to, to lower the stress level on the animal? So we're actually scientifically looking at these stress indicators and, and trying to adapt on the fly. Um, she's been able to do this. She works with a couple other uh, fishermen, uh, field so she's got a couple different methods that are used throughout the different uh, people that she's collaborating with. And so we can compare how, you know, how what we're doing compares to what other people are doing. And she tells us that we fare, we're doing very well. Um, so some other things that we do is we're, we use circle hooks and we crimp the barb. So at the end of a hook, you've got that little backwards swoop. And what that does is it, it, it keeps the bait on from falling off. And it also makes it harder for the hook to come out. Um, but it also makes it harder for us to get the hook out. So we crimp that barb down and use circle hooks as opposed to J hooks. And the, the advantage to that is we either don't catch the shark or almost 100% of the time we'll hook it very safely in and around the, the jaw. So that circle hooks by design are, are re greatly reducing a foul hooked animal. So hooking it in its gut, hooking it in its gills where you could cause tremendous stress and uh, injury to the animal, which would compromise it uh, potentially. Um, we, what else do we do? Uh, we keep the animals in the water. Um, so we'll face the boat up tide 
And so that as the animal's in the water, uh, it, it's constantly getting oxygen over its gills. And what I've actually added, because we had a couple of animals that Dr. Newton said, ah, the oxygen might be a little low on that one. So we, I actually added an irrigation pipe. And so we're, we're able to irrigate as well as keeping the animal in where we added that irrigation uh, pipe to make sure that we don't have another animal that, that loses oxygen along board. Uh, and then just working quickly, you know, working very quickly, very efficiently. Um, the team is very well trained so that, you know, even if it's your first time out, and a lot of times, most of my crew, it's their first time ever, we go through a very systematic approach. And I guess that's where my teaching skills come in. So that um, even if you've never done it before, you do it with precision and uh, um, quickness. So, so those are some of the major, those are, those are the things that we do to ensure that that the animals are, are released and almost all of them when we're done we take the tail rope off and and we we let them go they give a very strong kick off and they're they're out of here so um you know the one tag that we use the pop-off tag it, it's actually um designed to release if it hasn't changed depth in 24 hours and so we haven't had any that have popped that uh that that i know of um so indicating that either the tag was broke or the shark didn't die. So if it did die, sharks sink to the bottom and it would be laying on the bottom for longer than 24 hours, which would cause the tag to pop off and, and float to the surface. So, um, yeah, so. Yeah. Excellent. It's, uh, it took its trial and error, right? Over time to come up with the best techniques for the, for the shark's well-being. So that's great that we're doing that. And we're seeing less uh, stress on the sharks as we're processing them. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I'm sure the first shark was probably not 12 minutes, but we also weren't doing the, the amount of data collection either. So we've been able to collect more data in a quicker period of time um, as we get better and better and better, so. Dr. Curtis, can you talk about the different types of tags that we're using? And also from my, stand, from my perspective, I know we're, we're targeting four different shark species with this program. Can you inform the participants what tags we're using and what species of shark we're focusing on and why we're focusing on those sharks? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, as far as the species, we initially started with, with a focus on just the juvenile white sharks, um, but there we're, we catch other species uh, sort of along the way while we're looking for the white sharks. And, um, and most of these species also have limited data um, and uh, there haven't been a lot of tagging studies um, on some of these species or samples collected. And so we, we've started sort of expanding uh, to, to include sort of in our portfolio, uh, thresher sharks, dusky sharks, and sandbar sharks. Uh, duskies and sandbars look very similar. Sandbar sharks are your brown sharks, they um, call them locally. Uh, they're just sort of, uh, you know, kind of your cookie cutter looking kind of uh, brown shark. Um, but uh, duskies and sandbars are overfished. They're, they're rebuilding. Uh, we're trying to rebuild their populations and, and we need some more data uh, to help do that. Thresher sharks, uh, uncertain um, population status, uh, but the, the fishermen catch a lot of them and uh, our data will help um, sort of help understand the impacts of fisheries on, on thresher sharks as well as the other species. Um, as far as the tags, we're using uh, well, I guess now four main types of tags. Yeah, we can be uh, your Vanna White, Toby. I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, looks like so Chris has got it. We'll start with Chris. Chris, Chris is holding up a, a pop-up satellite tag. Um, I call him a PSAT, or some people call him a, a PAT tag, pop-up archival tag. And this is like, uh, um, you know, well, you can see the size of it. But it, basically, you attach this to the shark. It it stays on the shark and um, just follows along. You, um, and it uh, it archives depth and temperature and light level. Um, for a pre-programmed period, and then it pops off the shark. So most of the tags we use, we do this for a month. The tag stays on for a month. It records the, the depth, temperature, and light level, and then it releases from the shark, floats to the surface, and it sends us all the data all at once for the last month. And then we use that data to sort of piece together where it went um, and the habitat that it was swimming in during that time. Uh, the, the tag that we primarily used with OSEARCH is a, another type of satellite transmitter. It's, it's the fin-mounted satellite tag and this is the one that they use on the shark tracker website where it um essentially mounts okay there chris has got there you mount that to the dorsal fin and anytime the that antenna gets above the surface of the water it communicates with the argo satellite system 
and we basically get an email that hey the shark pinged and that's that's how search um, operates you, you get you hear these pings of these sharks up and down the coast and you're kind of learning in real time um, where the sharks where the sharks go and that that tag stays on for up to a couple years uh, before the bolts sort of rust out and it falls off the um, uh, additionally with OSearch we used acoustic tags which are small um, I don't know if you have any of those Chris but they're kind of the size of a chapstick and uh, and they're surgically implanted into the shark and so it this, works this like is not an, well this is not the one that goes in this but it's 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 basically this this part of it right here right it's part. similar size to that transmitter and so it's sort of like an easy pass for sharks the uh, the acoustic tag stays inside the body of the shark it doesn't doesn't hurt it it's uh, you know there's they're sutured up and and then that tag pings for up to 10 years. And so we can track the shark up and down the coast for up to 10 years. And, um, and that's something, so we're in our third year, fourth year of data collection now for some of the sharks we tagged in 2016, which is really, really kind of neat. We can track these sharks for the first 10 years of their life. Wow. Um, and so, but that just works differently. It's an acoustic signal. It's picked up by acoustic listening stations that are, that are sort of anchored in places up and down the coast. Um, and then finally, most recently and most expensively, we have our CATS uh, camera. This is a customized animal tracking solutions product. Um, it's, you, it, when you say most expensively, can you give us an idea of how much a tag like costs? Sure. So, yeah, so this tag, uh, with everything all included with the recovery receivers and everything, is approaching $10,000 for this tag. But it, it gives you everything in the kitchen sink. Um, super high resolution. Um, it's an acceleration tag, so it gives you 3D accelerometry, um, kind of like your cell phone does, or like or like a Fitbit. It can it, it can measure the tail beats of the shark, the position of the shark, its pitch and yaw in the water, how it rotates, um, and it gives you, it gives you that data at 20 times per second for the period it's on the shark. It also has an HD video camera built in, and so we mount that on the dorsal fin of the shark. The shark swims off you're getting HD video and all this acceleration as well as depth and temperature at a super high resolution for a day or two. So it's a shorter deployment, but you know, just billions of data points. And so that's why it's so expensive. Um, and it, it's, and it's challenging to uh, collect all that data um, and, and, and get it back. But it's ex when you get it back, it's extremely valuable data. So after, after a day or two, it pops off the shark and floats to the surface. And then Greg has to go spend half a day bobbing around on the ocean looking for it. And we find it by using a couple transmitters. So one is the satellite transmitter that Greg is holding. So that pings the satellite that gets us in the ballpark that can get us within about a football field of the tag out on the water. And then and we use, this, yeah. yeah, and then we use the a VHF, just a standard radio transmitter to get us the final distance. And, uh, and hopefully we, you know, we can find the tag, zoom in on it, triangulate where it is, and then pick it out of the water with a dip net. And then we plug it into the computer and we have millions of data points about um, every, every minute move that shark made for, for the previous day or two. Um, so it's really, um, you know, kind of fascinating. And, uh, and it, it's very cutting edge, it's very new. It's, it's only been used on a, on a few species around the world. And I, um, as far as I know, I think we're the first to, to deploy uh, that type of tag technology on a thresher or, or a juvenile white shark um, in the world. So it's, it's just exciting to be able to be, to be part of those first and get this really exciting data. Excellent. Just, 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 we're moving through the panel uh, discussion here. There's a few qu a question that came in and I, while you're on, Toby, somebody says uh, from Heather Doyle, does Cape Cod ever ask to collaborate with us, either with data, sharing data, or tagging efforts? Uh, so we uh, we communicate with the folks in Cape Cod quite a bit. I, I know Greg Skomel well. Uh, he's a state biologist who leads the Cape Cod sort of shark research efforts. He was actually my PhD advisor, um, and so so we keep in touch. They're they're very aware of of what we're doing down here, and we keep in touch on kind of what they're doing up in up at Cape Cod. But we're kind of working in parallel tracks. They're they're a few years ahead of us in, in what they're doing. Um, and they're dealing with the larger sharks and we're dealing with these, with these shark pups. So we're kind of doing different things and, um, but we're certainly looking, um, uh, you know, and, and look, there may be plenty of opportunity for collaboration, um, down the line, sort of comparing the movements of these little sharks to the larger sharks that they're working on up in Cape Cod. 
Yeah, and what's I mean, what's really pretty awesome is um, you know the the sharks that we're tagging literally the first few months of their life, as long as they survive, will end up on Dr. Skomel's uh, you know back door. So I can't I cannot wait for the first GoPro scan of a new shark, and there's like an apex predator tag sticking out of it. Um, they probably won't be able to read the number, but the fact that it's got an apex predator tag and and one of these little nubs, because this part here stays in the shark, that would, you know, since right now we're the only ones that are, are putting these tags on on those little guys, um, that would indicate that, that that was one of the sharks we caught many years ago. So I just can't, I, I'm waiting for that day. Awesome. Chris, can you, can you talk a little bit about what it means to have a, a, a nursery right up along the beaches here? What, what is it, people might not know what a nursery means. So... When, when we talk about the white shark nursery here on the, along the South Shore Long Island, can you talk a little bit about what that means as far as development and talk about the region that we're focusing on, like the New York Pipe? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the uh, as we've been talking, we keep saying that over and over again, like the, it's a nursery ground, it's a nursery ground. So a nursery ground is where a juvenile organism not necessarily a fish but if you're talking about a marine environment it could be crabs and shrimp you know so like shinnecock bay outside my office window here is a nursery for winter flounder summer flounder blackfish sea bass you know it's sheltered it's protected there's a lot of food um more importantly for those little fish there's pl plenty of shelter so eelgrass and places to hide um for a white shark the nursery that's been known is pretty much the new york bite which for those that don't know, that would be from, if you drew an imaginary line from Cape May, New Jersey, up to Montauk Point, and then along the shoreline to the city, you get like a flattened triangle. That's the New York Bight. So within the New York Bight, you know, a lot of times people don't realize it's one of the most busy, it's the busiest metropolitan in the world. You know, it's ships coming and going, there's all these people, but it's full of wildlife. I mean, there's whales, there's dolphins, as we were talking, there's a lot of sharks. There's lots of food, there's bunker there's skates, there's sea robin, there's mackerel, there's all the food that these sharks need. Now as a white shark, when they're first born, they're about just over a meter, around a meter in length. Um, there's fewer things at that size that are gonna eat you than like a little sea bass. So they don't necessarily need to be hiding in seaweed or eelgrass, but what they need is shallow water with a lot of food and that's the New York bite. And one thing we should point out is we've confirmed it's definitely a nursery, but we do not know where these sharks are pupped, where they're born. Um, we kind of speculate, maybe born down south a little bit and kind of move north, but we really don't know. So that's, you know, everyone always says they're born here, but it's really, it's a nursery. They're here after birth, but we don't know what point they are born. So again, there's just a ton of food for them here. Um, and a lot of the food they eat are this food that we encounter, like I said, bunkers, sea robins, skates, fluke, they're eating all those, those bony fish. You know, these little guys aren't eating seals. That's why they're here. You know, there's no seals generally in, in the New York fight during the summer months when these seals are here. I mean, when these sharks are here, I'm sorry. Right. So protecting and, and learning about these sharks, Chris, what is, what is their role? Like if, if we don't study them and protect them, what, what does it mean to the ecosystem of, of the marine environment if we don't do anything to protect them and sustain their populations? What happens to, to the marine oceans, to the oceans if we don't protect them? So, well, well, every th every little piece, whether you think it's important or not, is extremely important in the big picture. If you remove one item, uh, it could have a ripple effect, a negative ripple effect throughout the entire ecosystem. Something like a shark as a top predator, <clears throat> their job is to keep other populations healthy and strong. So around here, you know, they're eating fish you know, as juveniles. The adults, they're eating seals. If there are no sharks, the seal, seal populations can get out of control. If seal populations get out of control, well, they might overfeed on cod or other things that maybe aren't for, that are also important to us. So it's really a, a delicate balance. Um, and again, if you just take one of these key things out, it could be detrimental to everything around it. Uh, me and Greg were talking just the other day. I mean, it's not a shark or anything, but mosquitoes. You know, we yeah. hate mosquitoes. We're trying to eradicate mosquitoes. But if we were to be successful in eradicating mosquitoes, whole ecosystems around us, land and water would collapse. They're a vital part of it, you know, just like the sharks. Without those top predators to keep things in check, everything will run amok. So uh, it's really important to know where, what important habitat is for these, these fish um, so that, you know, we can uh, make sure it's protected. Hmm. There's a question here from 
Angie, and uh, probably probably this is probably more towards towards Greg's uh, a question for Greg. Yeah. So the question is: as someone who appreciates the amount of effort and time that goes into the the work that all of us do, when you caught and tagged the Dresha shark, how was the overall health and appearance of the shark? How was its behavior upon catch and release? Yeah. And is it a place that all of us who are interested can be updated about the sharks that are tagged. Yeah, this is great. Um, and uh, so I can tell you that, that we know exactly how that shark reacted for at least the first 24 hours after we let it go because it, it, was, ta it was actually double tagged. So we had the cat's cam on one side and we had the PSAT pop off on the other side. Um, the tag, I believe, was on 23 hours, uh, the cat's cam. <clears throat> and we recovered it 23 miles away. So clearly the shark was uh, getting the heck out of Dodge. So we caught it off of uh, Shinnecock. It was, it was about, I think about four, three or four miles south of Shinnecock Inlet when we caught it. When the tag popped, it was three to four miles south of Marich's, a uh, little past Marich's Inlet. Um, so it, it uh, and, and what was really great is we could see what its recovery was. And this is one of the powers of this cat scam building into the management and understanding of animals. So just because you uh, catch a fish and let it go and it swims away doesn't necessarily mean it survived. That could have been a catastrophic event to it. And how would you know if you didn't have some sort of technology or way to monitor that? And so these cat scams and these pop of these satellite, these electronic tags allow us to be able to get that information. And so what you can see is basically when we let the shark go, um, it pretty much just glided down to the bottom. It hit the bottom and it kicked up off the bottom a few feet. It went back down to the bottom and then it kicked up a few more feet. And then it didn't quite hit the bottom and then it came up and then it slowly over time just went up into the water column. Um, and so, so it was very, very clear that the, that the shark was certainly tired from, uh, from its experience, which you would expect, um, but was able to recover and, and swim basically um, you know, at least a mile an hour uh, away. So that's, uh, it, when we caught it, it acted as, as any other thresher. Um, they're very, very powerful animals. They're very uh, uh, acrobatic. They often jump at least once or twice. Uh, they swim very hard, very strong. So that was all normal. Um, uh, catch and release. Is there a place that, so place of interest that can be updated as far as the tags and tagging information? So certainly the exhibit right behind Frank is updated. Um, if you follow any or all of our social medias, um, we, we update snapshots of data and information along the way. Uh, Chris talks, he gives all, all of his lectures. You know, we, we try to update him on, and Toby updates us on the data that's collected. If one of our collaborating scientists publish a paper or, or gives us data that uh, is relevant to our work, we'll, we'll share that. Um, and then ultimately, you know, as, as the studies and um, our, our, peer, our published and peer-reviewed journal articles, then certainly we make those um, articles available to, to the public on our social media sites and stuff. So um, Toby might be able to answer that a little bit better if I missed any place, but um, so I think right. I covered all the answers on the pressure shirt. So as we're at this portion of our panel speaking program, I'd like to encourage participants to keep asking questions through the chat uh, capability. So the next Thanks, Frank. Yeah. There was, a, there was a question that just came in under the Q&A section. Uh, uh -huh. It just kind of goes back to what I had just said, so I just want to answer that question. So uh, Jerry had asked a couple questions, and we have answered the first two already. Um, but the last one she just asked, do we know uh, if the nursery is new to this area or has it always been here? Uh, well, the paper that Toby and Greg have been referencing, actually Toby is an author on, uh, was in 2010, Toby? The, this paper Sorry, that you- 2014. Uh, 2014. 2014. So that data, he, he compiled data from 1800s to 2010, and there was 630, 39? He didn't read the paper. Don't believe him. He's, he didn't. I just read the title. That's all, you know. But, uh, but Toby could talk a little bit more about that. But, yeah, they've definitely it's, – it's been known for some time uh, that it's, it's been a possible nursery ground. Just a lot of the work we've been doing is kind of solidifying that. 
uh, to be true. And Toby could add more to that if I missed anything. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I think it's been a nursery area for white sharks for thousands of years. Like, you know, just they've been there. We only have just started to understand uh, that they're here. Um, and, you know, we've only found that out in the last hundred years or so. And now just in the last five years, we've been able to fill in the gaps on, well, how long are they here? Where do they hang out when they're here? When do they show up? When do they leave? Um, and those are the kind of big questions we didn't um, have answers to before. And so I think I think Long Island and the New York Bight has been a white shark nursery for, for a long, long time. But we're just now really starting to realize it and being able to study it um, in a really, you know, more robust way. And that goes back to what I had said earlier about just we don't know in our own little backyard, you know, there's so many unknowns. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's where this comes in is, again, educating people to what's in, just in your own backyard. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about the rainforests and places that are far away from us, but sometimes it's hard to comprehend that kind of stuff. But this is in our own backyard. So this is, uh, to me, that's what makes this most exciting. That's, it's interesting you say that. This so the South Fork Natural History Museum was founded and it was created with that in mind that people know more about exotic species and places other than Long Island. They didn't know, they knew more about things that were in Africa than they knew that were here on the South Fork of Long Island. And our founding fathers 31 years ago said we need to create an organization to inform and educate people about what's right here in their backyard. And, it's amazing the diversity of wildlife that we have here, and there's still many unknowns that we need to to figure out. Um, you don't you don't have to go to Africa or Australia to see great white sharks. They're literally right in your backyard. They're yes, literally in your backyard. Yeah, so speaking of, speaking of the white shark nursery, Dr. Curtis, can you give us some uh, idea of how significant the white shark nursery here is on the South Fork is where, is, where else is there a white shark nursery on the planet? Do we know how many? Sure, other the, yeah, there's, there's only a couple other sort of con well uh, confirmed or studied white shark nurseries in the entire world. One is in Eastern Australia. Um, one is in Southern California and down to Baja, California. Um, and there's, got, there's one somewhere sort of in South Africa, there's juveniles that are caught in, in certain areas of the South African coast. Uh, hmm. but that's it, there's maybe four spots around the world where there's a confirmed hmm. white shark nursery area and South Fork of Long Island is one of those places. It's the only confirmed white shark nursery area in the entire North Atlantic Ocean. It's incredible, it's amazing that we it's, have that right here. It's, it's, right really, it's really unique and, and really Good. special. Yeah, and I think the reason that we create these programs and have these initiatives is to inform and make people aware that this is right here and we have to sustain it, we have to protect it, because it really is connected to our health and the health of the planet. So uh, that's very important. So uh, there's another question. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think uh, how many white sharks survive from the 10 to 12 in a litter, that probably fits in right with what our, we're talking about. So that... Yeah. Do we know, Toby? I, I, I don't know. Is there any? Yeah, we, we don't really know. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the things that some of our tagging work could help um, understand, understanding what we call natural mortality rates of, of these pups. Um, but generally, because these sharks are born at, you know, four feet long, and uh, they're born an apex predator, essentially, survival is very high in general uh, for sharks, especially for white sharks. They're born bigger than most other fish in the ocean. Um, and there's been some studies on adult, adult white sharks that their annual, their sort of year to year survival is over 90%. And, and um, so, but the populations overall are, are, you know, are still small compared to other animals in the ocean. Um, and then when you put fishing mortality into the mix, uh, that can quickly swamp the sort of background the sort of natural mortality rates. And that's what causes overfishing. Um, and so there's a lot of shark populations around the world have suffered from overfishing in the past. In the U.S. we're doing a better job um, conserving our shark populations and a number of populations, number, number of species, including white sharks, are showing very good evidence of population increases because of the conservation efforts uh, that we've, we've put in place over the last 20, uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, same thing with the whales, like Chris said, we've been protecting them for 30, 40 years and, and they, they come back. When you protect things, they can come back. And that's what we're seeing with the white sharks and a lot of other species. Um, but you have to have a handle on 
uh, you have to have the data to understand how, you know, what your, how big an impact your fisheries uh, catches might be having. And so that's one of the, one of the pieces of the puzzle we're, we're working on. So uh, there's a question in the chat before we get to the Q&A, Chris. Um, the Q&A, we've already, we've answered those, so we're good. Okay, so there's, there's Irene J. Gonna, Irene J. is clear them. Irene J is asking how many white sharks survive out of the ten or so in the litter. Does anybody know any any uh, information about how many on, in the litter actually survive to I don't know adulthood or juvenile stage? I mean, do they get eaten by other sharks? Do they are that, can somebody explain how many you think survive in the litter that are yeah, that, I mean, that's sort of what we were just talking about, how the survival generally is pretty high. The only, uh, the only thing that can eat a juvenile white shark is pretty much a larger white shark or a tiger shark in New, in New York waters. Um, they have no other, even, at, even when they're born, they really have no other natural predators. Um, and it's really fascinating to see, it's part of the reason why I think Long Island, New York bite is a nursery, is because the, the larger white sharks don't hang out off close to shore off Long Island very much. They, they move up north, they move up to Cape Cod, Maine and Canada, and they don't spend a lot of time. They kind of pass by Montauk and, and they migrate up and down the coast, but they don't spend a lot of time near shore um, off Long Island. And, and the pups sort of have a refuge from those potential predators um, by being here. So in general, this they're, you know, I think the survival is very high for, for white shark pups. All right. so. We're approaching an hour from the beginning of this presentation. I gotta ask you guys, I need an update as to what's going on in this field. Who, who would like to update me and the participants on what's going on with this, this year's field season? Any surprises? Any updates? Uh, so I, I guess, I guess I'll, do that and then Toby and Chris you can fill in if I forget anything so we uh, we officially started uh, fishing uh, back in May um, COVID has caused all kinds of problems but um, we have also had some some successes so uh, you know I was able to start a little earlier with um, with, with because COVID but it didn't really it didn't really um, result in much we really didn't catch so we, we fished a, a several days in May and early June before we caught our first shark at all. Um, first shark was a, was a blue shark, which is pretty typical. And, um, and then since then, um, we, we've actually started out um, pretty, pretty, really, really well. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with us adding more vessels to the fleet. So, um, you know, I, I have started out and all the fishing only really ever happened off my boat. Um, we've Matt Burkout, Captain Matt Burkout from Stay Salty Inc. has uh, he's got his own boat and gear and has spent uh, two years specifically on my boat getting trained in the techniques that we talked about earlier. Um, he has now gone on, caught, tagged, worked up his own animals, including white sharks, independent of of me. So he's good to go. Uh, Walter Zublionis also has uh, his own boat and gear now and has. Um, is fully capable of going out and doing doing what we've done. He's worked with me pretty much since the beginning, so he's almost as he's, he's as equal in terms of field handling and uh, of animals as we are. So by adding these additional boats, um, more hooks in the water equals more success. So in terms of success, um, we we have uh, a couple of um, bruised egos. Uh, I guess I shouldn't say a couple. I guess I should say one. And that bruised ego is, is actually mine because uh, I guess I did too good of a job training Captain Matt Burkow because he has uh, actually caught and tagged more young of the year white sharks than I have so far this year, which is one. So we're so awesomely excited about that. Um, I think this is one of the earliest that we've, we've tagged since we've been tagging. So I'm super happy. So we've got, we do have one juvenile white shark tag so far this year. Um, we have uh, also uh, a fresh shark tag this year, uh, which was actually a tag that was donated to the program by um, East Meadow uh, High School fundraised and was able to buy a, a 
low tech PSAT. So low tech, there's a question here about the manufacturers. So low tech is the one that makes the, the PSAT. And so they were able to come out with us and had their tag. And we were able to tag uh, Thresher Shark. And in addition, we have, so you mentioned the, the other species that we're looking to expand to. And so I'm also happy to report that we also have uh, our first PSAT on a dusky shark for the, for the SOFO shark research program and our first PSAT on a sandbar shark. So of the species that we've been, that we're targeting currently this year, uh, we've, we've tagged all but uh, a smooth hammerhead. And we've had a couple smooth hammerhead buzzing around our boats, but we haven't had one to uh, take the hook yet. So uh, in, in the few weeks that we've, we've been fishing since May, but in the few weeks that we've actually started to catch sharks, uh, we've had tremendous success. So no cats cam deployments yet, um, basically the, the reason for that is you need two day weather window. Um, you need a nice day to go out and catch the shark. And then you have to have the next day needs to also be nice because as we mentioned, you have, I have to go out and find it. And so these are very difficult to find on a flat calm day, basically impossible to find on a windy day. So, uh, as we're still sort of in that early summer, you know, it's hard to get two nice days in a row. Um, the cats cams are ready to go. We had a shot this past week, but the thresher shark was flopping around in our chum slick. It, it, we just didn't get a hook in them to be able to apply the cat scam. So it looks like Saturday and Sunday is going to be another weather window. So I'm hoping to, uh, to put out, to be able to say on our Tuesday SOFO posts that uh, we were able to get a cat scam out this weekend. So um, super excited, super proud of everyone. Um, the list of people that have participated this year is, is much, much, much shorter than it normally is and that's simply because of COVID you know we just we all need to be safe we all need to be you know normally I would be bringing six people out on my boat at a time and and I'm limiting it to three to four and that includes me so um mm. I can't thank Walter and Matt and my, and my dad Jeff for uh spending so much time out there because if it wasn't wasn't for those guys you know I can't do this by myself I need at least three or four people and um you know we're all either living together or, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it's safe mm -hmm. to go out. Um, so I apologize for if anybody has been um, requesting to come out this year. It's just very difficult. You know, we had to cancel our Montauk expedition, which is why we're doing this panel discussion virtually. Um, so hopefully COVID's gone and, and next field season, I can start to accommodate more requests to get out in the field. But I'm um, <laughs> super happy with the work that we've been able to accomplish so far. And bring on August for some more. That's right. White August sharks. a very active month for shark activity. Yeah. Tell Dr. Curtis, there's a question with Greg uh, discussing about the tags, and you need a two day window to deploy a cat's cam tag and then have a nice day the following day to retrieve it. Uh, there's a question from a gentleman named Mike Chacon asking are the pop off and cat's cams, are they able to be reused if we find them? Yeah, the, the CATS cam definitely relies on being uh, sort of recovered and reused. And uh, being about $10,000, you want to make sure you got a good weather window to get it back. Um, so yeah, the CATS cam is reused uh, repeatedly as long as many times as you can uh, before at, uh, you know, before you eventually lose it somehow. <laughs> and hopefully that won't happen for a while. Uh, we have a colleague uh, Dr. Taylor Chapel, who's, who's helped us out a ton on the CATS cam end of the research. And he's had a couple of these cameras for, I think, approaching 10 years, I think. So some of them, uh, you know, can last a long time. Uh, the pop-up tags, basically you get one deployment, but if you recover them, uh, you can, uh, they, you know, they pop up and then they drift to the beach often. And so we, we've actually recovered almost half of the, the pop-up tags we put out. Um, if you recover them, you can send them back to the manufacturer or low-tech, and they'll basically give you a refurbished pop-up tag for half the cost of the original. So it's actually a really good deal. So the more tags, more of these tags we can recover, uh, the more tags we can we can get to continue the research. And, and uh, I don't and know so if we mentioned how much those are. Those are two grand a piece. Yeah. Right. So brand brand new, each of those pop up tags is two thousand dollars. And if we can recover it and send it back to low tech, we can get a new one for for a thousand dollars. And that's huge. And that's um, so for. Four of the tags we have for this field season are from re tags that we recovered last year. Um, it's it's really great, really helpful way to you know to boost the research at and and save money at the same time. Chris, and, uh, go ahead, Greg. 
Well, I'm just going to say, just to finish up, CATS, you hear us talk about CATS. It's capital C, capital A, capital T, capital S. That stands for Customized Animal Tracking Solutions, which is the company that builds the very fancy uh, tag. Chris, there's a question in the Q&A portion of this Zoom program. Do you have any idea at what age or point the juveniles leave the nursery area? Do you have any ideas about how you might be able to track them over a longer period of time? This is a question from one of our younger members, William, who's interested in, in, in our shark program. Any idea how long they stay here and when they leave the nursing area and how to track them over a the period of time? I think Toby would have a better grasp or answer for that. Um, but they do leave in the winter, the fall. They're not here. They don't. They're not here year round. That's one thing we should point out. Our data has shown that they do migrate south in the winter, and come back for maybe, how many years, Toby? Is it estimated they come back? Yes. Yeah, uh, so far, it's at least three years. Um, they and I think they um, they probably start spending less and less time in New York waters as they grow. Um, we've had some sharks that were just a year old go, move up to Massachusetts. Sharks that are two years old move all the way up to Maine, mm. um, but they still are spending a fair amount of time off Long Island. So I think they're, you know, they, they, I think Long Island for the first two or three years of their life is sort of home base. Um, but then they start exploring further and further as they get a little bigger. They're temperate species, so they, they move based on temperature, correct? Or is it food, food resource why they move? Yeah, we, we think we think it's both. It's a combination of a comfortable temperature and and food availability. So, mm -hmm. um, as the sharks get bigger, you know they can they can take on uh, larger prey. They can swim further um, without using as much energy, and uh, you know and their temperature tolerance sort of expands as they get bigger. Um, yeah, so they, uh, there was an incident a couple of years ago off of Montauk in the winter where somebody saw an adult white shark take out a gray seal. I actually interviewed that lady. Yep, I spoke to her on the phone. Did the shark was migrating south at that particular time, or what, what was the story with that adult being in our backyard? Uh, yeah, so yes, the past the months. Right, I think that's part of the migration cycle of the adults, the bigger white sharks. They pass by um, Long Island in the spring, you know, like uh, April, May and they start moving up to their sort of northern summer grounds off Cape Cod and, and Gulf of Maine. And, uh, and then they migrate south, uh, just like, or just like the, the white shark pups do. They leave October, November. And because these larger white sharks are further north, they start migrating south in October, November. They pass by you know, Long Island later in, the, later in the fall and into the winter. So they're generally passing by Montauk um, and along the South Shore you know, twice a year in the spring and the summer, but they don't, they don't really stop and hang out for very long. They just kind of pass by and the shark, um, you know, happened to pass by when there were seals, um, you know, starting to move in off Montauk and it, it took advantage of that. Well, the, the other thing to keep, uh, to, as a reminder too, even with some of O-Search's work, uh, Mary Lee was off of East Hampton in January during yep. her migration stuff. So, you know, that's the thing too, you know, the seals are here in the winter, you know, I find, I personally would find it hard to believe if Mary Lee was here, that she was the only one that would ever be here in the winter time. So chances are that there's probably a few in the winter months, but let's face it, who's he, who here is even me, I'm, I'm on the water, but not that much, you know, to see right, that kind that's, of setup. Definitely not fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something, I like, something I like to remind people is that, you know, the, the tag sharks are a small number uh, of all the sharks in the ocean, right? Like most of the sharks out there are, don't have any tags on them yet. Um, you know, Osearch and Greg Skolmo and others are, are upping those numbers, but you know, for every shark that pings, we know where it is. There's probably, you know, there could easily be, be a dozen more that don't have tags that are doing, you know, ha maybe hanging out in the same area. You know, and the, and the, sec the second part of that initial question too was about the, uh, how can we track them over a longer time? And mm -hmm. we've already kind of been doing that because that first tag that Greg put out back in 15 was double the size of the low-tech tag that we use today. Um, so technology is getting better every year. They get smaller, they get stronger battery life. Um, you know, so that's the other thing. When we get a tag and we send it back to low-tech, I'm sure they're taking it apart and looking at it, modifying, making it better. And again, as batteries get smaller, um, here at Stony Brook, some of the tags that we're putting out on fish, like, we're acoustic tagging summer flounder with these little tiny tags, you know, so 
uh, tagging technology is getting better and it's going to allow us to see these a bigger, a longer picture. Are those PSAT tags, are we able to um, get them to pop off later than 28 days? Can we pop them off in 32 days and, and 40 days if we, we need to? Or Yeah, currently there's, there's pop-up tag models that go for up to a year, about a year. Oh, wow. So, so they're, they're twice as expensive. They cost four or $5,000 but they could track the shark for an entire year and then pop off and then sort of transmit a, a year's worth of data um, all at once. You get a, it's a lower resolution. Uh, you don't get the sort of fine scale data that we get from the short term tags. So it's a bit of a trade off. You get a longer track, but uh, lower resolution depth and temperature information. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, but those tags are getting better. You know, maybe it won't be long before the tags are smaller and probably recording for two years. Uh, so it's, you know, it's exciting as the technology progresses. There's a question from Jerry Maslanka. Has your work caused any changes to the behaviors or regulations to the local fishing industry? Who can answer that? Have we given any input and data to marine managers and New York State marine resource managers to kind of have any change in commercial fishing industries or local fishing industries? So uh, basically we, we share um, annual updates with both the state of New York, the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, by the way, they have a great shark website that everyone should check out, New York State DEC shark website. Um, there's a way to sort of uh, report sightings of sharks and there's a lot of great info about shark regulations and shark biology and stuff. Um, so but we, we share our, our uh, annual summaries with the state and with federal, um, you know, with NOAA, who I work for, um, and uh, they provide permits for our research. So we have to share uh, basically the, you know, the, the numbers of sharks we catch and tag and that kind of thing. Um, we've all, and we also, the other main way we get the word out is, is through scientific publications. So, so far, the project has resulted in one, uh, one scientific paper that came out a couple years ago. That's the one we we're really able to sort of confirm the area is a white shark nursery. And so managers, um, there hasn't, it hasn't affected any changes to regulations at this point, but it's, it's another uh, piece of information that is available um, to resource managers, um, you know, to, to consider when they're doing management regulations for, uh, for sharks um, or for activities in the, in the New York bite. For, and, and a nice example is uh, offshore wind. Right now there's a number of wind farms that are proposed to be, um, you know, built, uh, constructed off the South Shore and before a couple of years ago, the, those, you know, those companies the, um, and the government didn't know that this is a white shark nursery area, you know, right where they want to put these wind farms. And so, um, and so, but that's, that's information now that the developers have and they can assess their, their impacts, their environmental impacts. They can talk about the impact on the habitat of these white sharks and other shark species um, and, and what those impacts could be on their development. So it, it's, um, it hasn't resulted in any, you know, real tangible changes in regulation yet, but it's a piece of information that um, marine resource managers can rely on um, you know, when they're considering uh, regulations or habitat uh, conservation issues. There's another question from Jason in the Q&A. Before, before I get to Jason's question, uh, Captain Matt Burkout says that we currently have a 53-day tag on a white shark right now. So to answer that previous question about are we able to have tags stay longer on a shark, it seems as though Matt is saying we have a 53-day uh, tag on, on the white shark right now. So Yes, yeah, we had a few tags this season that, that were 50, had a 53-day duration. So we're, we're just going to – we're trying those out this year to see how well they work. Cool. Excellent. So this question from Jason, I'm not sure which one of you panel speakers can answer this, but he's saying, are there any prevailing theories as to why these sharks migrate as far up northeast as they do? And is there any concern for the food webs and the species that belong to lower trophic levels that comprise them as a result of the shark's introduction? You guys... Well, I mean, I think Chris, I think Chris, Chris did a nice job of sort of explaining sharks in general as their role in the environment. So if sharks are expanding, it's probably because um, their, their food is there or the habitat is more conducive to them. So, so by them showing up into the environment, 
in a, even if it's a new area, it's probably a, a need for the, that environment to have a top predator come in to help start regulating and, and population control. And I think the great example is the seals. You know, the seals and, and the cape, you know, their populations are, are exploding. And, you know, the, the, the white sharks weren't always there. Um, when the seals weren't there, the sharks weren't there. Now that the seals are there, the sharks are starting to come back and they're actually helping to maybe slow that population growth. So if they're expanding to new areas, it's, it's, it's probably going to be ultimately a good thing for, for the environment. And, it, and the environment's actually calling them to come. Exactly. And a thing to point out about those seals too, those are the gray seals up at the Cape. Um, they were hunted to extinction in the United States. Um, so they were gone for quite a while, but the Marine Mammal Protection Act has brought them back. And again, just to continue that whole like bunker and everything, it's, it's all important. Absolutely. One last question before we call it a, a program. There's a question in the Q&A from Irene Jay. Uh, are white sharks always solo and not in school or groups? Uh, can somebody answer that? Are they always isolated and by themselves or do they kind of school up on occasion and swim in groups? You know, white sharks aren't considered um, to school very often, but they do aggregate. You know, they kind of hang out in similar areas, um, like feeding aggregations, you know, like we have it, um, you know, off the South Shore, off Cape Cod. So the sharks aren't swimming in like a school, um, like you might see other sharks do, or like a school of bait fish. They're kind of all kind of, we think anyway, they're all kind of doing their own thing. They're kind of operating um, solo. They're kind of doing their own thing. Um, but then they just sort of all hang out at the same sort of buffet um, in, different, in different spots along the coast. So they're, they definitely interact. Um, you know, they're kind of bumping into each other from time to time. They, they're passing by each other. Uh, but they don't really school or form, um, you know, sort of uh, social groups or swim together uh, as far as we know. Fantastic. Greg, I got a question for you before we conclude here. Yes. When are, we all, when are all four of us going to get together and go on your boat and, and experience what you do uh, for this program together, man? Because I would love to get on a boat with you three guys and, and have at it, man. So maybe. How about uh, the 11th to the 21st? <laughs> Any, any, any of those days, that was, that was the original dates that we all had blocked out for the Montauk expedition. And I think most of us have sort of kept that open. So I would say, uh, you know, let's, let's see about some window between the 11th and, and 21st of August. Okay. Well, that was a great presentation guys. And I really appreciate for the participants for, for uh, joining in today, but you guys taking the, uh, the time to get away from your busy schedules to help us with this, this presentation. So I wanna thank everybody. And to let everybody know out there, if you wanna continue getting updates and learning more about this program, visit our website or email us at uh, sharks at sofro.org. And yep. That's monitored by Greg and Toby and myself. So we'll be sure to answer you in a timely manner if you have any questions. There were a couple of questions that I didn't get to on this, uh, this, this program today and I will try to answer them in an email in the near future. So do you I'll know? Just, I'm just gonna add to um, next Wednesday, uh, I'm speaking for the museum about underwater Long Island. So I'll be talking about a lot of the food that the white sharks eat. So check out SOFO's website to register for that. It'll be next Wednesday at seven, I believe. So just something else to keep in mind if, uh, if you want to continue learning about our, our backyard and our ecosystem. Fantastic, yeah, you, uh, you, you do a few programs for us uh, each quarter. So we appreciate what you do. So thank you for that. Greg, Toby, I hope to see you guys soon. I know we usually get together in August for a live presentation for, uh, to get updated about your, your work that you're doing, but unfortunately with these, under these circumstances, things are gonna have to be done virtually in the future. I hope to get another update with you guys maybe later on in September to kind of keep the community updated on what's going on with this program. Um, Absolutely, that'd be great. Thank you for this opportunity, Frank, putting it together and the undying support of the museum. You know, I really, it just, the, the amount Thank of you. work that you and Diana and your staff do to to help foster and support and, and 
obtain the funding that you've been able to to keep us doing what we're doing. It's really, thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, right. thanks, Greg. And to be continued, and I hope we can do this for many years to come. So thanks, guys, and I'll be in touch. So thanks, everybody, for participating, and we'll see you down the road. Thank thanks. you. All right. Have a great thank night, you. everyone. Thank you, thank you for participating.